problem. Don't feel sorry for me because you have it too. I've had it for a long, long time. When I was a small boy, I was born, by the way, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is the county seat and the home of the Pennsylvania Dutch, Amish, Mennonites, and just plain Pennsylvania Dutchmen. And there were some sayings back in those days that I shall never forget. For example, they still out in the light, or they throw Papa down the stairs his hat, or they throw the cow over the fence some hay. But I can remember my mother and my grandmother having a conversation. And as a small boy, I was curious to know what they were talking about. They didn't want me to know. And my grandmother said, now go on and play. And I said, I want to hear. My grandmother said, what you don't know can't hurt you. How many of you have ever heard that expression? What you don't know can't hurt you. Well, I would like to begin a short series of studies tonight on a subject to remind you that what you don't know can hurt you. It works both ways. Ignorance may be bliss. And there are times when it's good for us not to know some things. But there are some times when what we don't know can hurt us. I was saved in 1927 by a teenage girl who bought me a Bible for a Christmas present and led me to Christ. And that day that I was saved, I sincerely believed that all of my bad habits would be gone from me. That girl was my idol and my model of a Christian. Quiet, conservative, clean living, wholesome girl. And I just assumed that that Christmas day I received Christ as my Savior, that all of my bad habits would be gone. My pride, jealousy, dishonesty, lying, deceit. I thought, man, things are going to be just great. But it didn't happen that way. And I was quite confused about that as a young Christian. As I grew on a couple of years, I spoke to other Christians and I found that they were in the same boat. And that leads me to bring to you a brief series of studies on a neglected doctrine in the Scriptures. And I want to discuss with you tonight and tomorrow and possibly on another occasion the two natures in the Christian. The two natures in the Christian. Now after a Christian gets saved, he has within him or within her two capacities. If you don't care for the term two natures, don't leave. I will show you it's a biblical term. This is what the Bible teaches. We have two capacities. The one is the capacity to do good. The other is a corrupt capacity or a corrupt nature designed on doing evil. And those two capacities within the child of God are in constant conflict. That's my problem. And that conflict has never ceased in my 62 years as a Christian. And you have that problem too. For these two capacities, these two natures are constantly at odds with each other. There is that one capacity to do good and oh, how it longs to do good. There is that capacity with its tendencies to do evil and oh, how it does its evil. And we find ourselves in a great conflict. In fact, the situation got so bad when my badness would not go away as a Christian, my fondest expectations had exploded into nothingness. Now, I never once doubted that I was saved. In 62 years as a Christian, I have never once 
questioned my salvation. But I have battled with these two capacities within me. I have battled with them today. And the conflict goes on every day of my life. You have that problem. And you need to be aware of that. Why do you do the things you don't want to do? And why do you fail to do the things you know you ought to do? Simply because you have two capacities, two possibilities, two selves, if you please, two natures, and they are in constant conflict, the one with the other. We want to pursue our study on the basis of three major thrusts. First of all, I want you to consider the fact of the two natures. And then secondly, we will pursue the function of the two natures. And thirdly, we must consider the faction that goes on between the two natures. Now to lay a foundation for our study, I would like to discuss briefly with you the meaning of the term nature. Now I must concede at the outset that the terms the two natures or the old nature or the new nature do not appear in the Bible. I agree to that. There's no question about that. Theologians have adopted terms to accommodate the terms to the great biblical truths. For example, the word Trinity does not appear in the Bible. But every child of God in this audience is a Trinitarian. You believe in a tri-personal God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But you can't find the word Trinity in the Bible. But that word was coined by theologians to accommodate this great theme and to bring it to people. The word rapture does not appear in the Bible. Perfectly good term coined by theologians to convey and to clarify great truths found within the confines of God's holy word. The rapture comes from the Latin rapto, the idea of seizing up, catching up, taking up, and there's a thought of suddenness and ecstasy attached to it, an ecstatic experience, a catching up, a rapturous experience. You can't find the word in the Bible, but the truth is there in the Bible term has been coined to simply accommodate these great facts found within the Holy Scriptures. Or you can take the word millennium. You won't find it in your Bible. It isn't there. But all that that word connotes and all that that word conveys is taught in the Bible. From two Latin terms, mille annus, a thousand years. And the Bible teaches of a literal thousand year reign of Christ. But the word itself is not in the Bible. Now I said and repeat, the term, the two natures, the old nature, the new nature, those terms themselves are not found in the Bible. Now open your Bible please to Ephesians chapter 4. And I would like to bring to your attention some biblical terms which describe these two capacities these two natures within the child of God. Why are you struggling between right and wrong? Why is there that conflict within you between good and evil? Here are some biblical terms that will help you to understand why the conflict goes on. I'm reading from Ephesians chapter 4, and I'll read verse 22. To conserve a little time, I'm going to break into a sentence here. Writing by inspiration, Paul said in Ephesians 4.22 that she put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. I'm reading from the King James Version. You may have a modern translation which translates it the old self. I'll go for that, no problem. The old man, the old self, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind that ye, be, that ye put on the new man. A modern translation has it, the new self. I have no problem with that. 
There's the old man, there's the new man. There's the old self, there is the new self. They are in constant conflict. Underline those two terms in your Bible and turn over, please, to Colossians chapter 3. Paul's letter to the Colossians chapter 3. I want to read beginning with verse 9. Keep your ballpoint pen handy and mark your Bible. As you read it, you'll find these terms flashing out before you. You will never forget them. Colossians 3, 9. Lie not one to another. You ever wonder why you as a Christian lie? Why we Christians can't always be truthful? We want to be. And when we're not, we hate ourselves because we're not truthful. When we falsify the records on our income tax return, it annoys us, it bothers us no end. And we say, why as a Christian can't I be honest? Well, here's the answer. There's two selves. There are two capacities within the child of God. Colossians 3, verse 9. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man. Or if you like the old self better, have no problem with that. Verse 10, and have put on the new man. Mark in your Bible those terms, the old man, the new man, the old self, the new self. These are the two natures. These are the two capacities. These are the two selves within us in constant conflict. Turn over now to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. When you found Galatians 5, will you please look at verse 17. Verse 16 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now you say, what is the flesh here? The flesh is the faulty human self, the faulty human nature that we inherited from Adam. That's the flesh. If you like the word self, use it. Look up from your Bibles for just a moment. I have lifted my hand before you. What you see on the skeleton of that hand is flesh. Now, that is not the meaning of the word flesh here, the literal flesh that covers the skeleton of our bodies. But if you drop the last letter, you have F-L-E-S-H, Drop that last letter H and spell the four remaining letters backwards, S-E-L-F. That's the meaning of the word flesh in Galatians chapter 5 and in other passages we will be looking at during our study. It's the self, the faulty nature, the faulty self, the old man, if you please, the old nature, if you please. Galatians chapter 5, I read verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh, the old faulty nature, that old self, lusteth or warreth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. There you have the conflict stated. Paul's writing to Christians. Ephesians and Colossians were written to believers, not to unsaved people. These New Testament epistles are teaching us that there's something going on within us. It will continue until the day that we are conformed to the perfect image of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I must say at the outset that there will never be, there will never be in this life an eradication of the old self, a total eradication of the old nature. And the oldest person in this audience who has been saved the greatest number of years will have to admit that the conflict goes on within you as it does within me. When I was pastoring the Highland Park Church, incidentally, 
Dr. Stoll was one of my successors there. And I would like to say, in all honesty, this is no, nothing to build him. He doesn't need anybody to build him up. But the church reached a new high in not only its attendance, but in its spiritual growth during the years of Dr. Stowell's ministry there. But during my tenure there, back in the 1950s, there was a man in the church, an elderly man. <laughs> I say elderly because back in the 1950s, a man who was uh, 78 years old was an old man. <laughs> And here I am, and uh, I'm not ready to admit that I'm an old man. But uh, nevertheless, this dear brother, and he was a saint. He lived within walking distance of the church in Highland Park. And every morning, that old godly man walked to the church, found a room to have a time of prayer for the pastor and the staff and the missionaries and the members of the church who were sick. In Detroit, we had ice storms and snowstorms. That godly old man never failed to walk to church in the morning to have his prayer time. Now, he could have prayed at home, but he was drawn to the people in the church, and that's where he went to pray. One day, I received a telephone call from him. He was weeping. He said, Pastor, can you come? I said, Brother, yes, what has happened? He said, please hurry, it's terrible. I got in my car and dashed to his house. I said, what did you do or what has been done to you? He said, nothing yet, nothing yet. But he said, pastor, you will never believe some of the wicked thoughts that have been in my mind this morning. There was a godly old man who was a a truly spirit-filled man if there ever was one. But you see, he was not without the possibility and the potentiality of thinking evil, of speaking evil, of doing evil. None of us are immune from that possibility. Why? Because there is within every child of God two capacities, two selves, two natures, and they are in constant Conflict. Now, these few references that I've given to you do not even begin to exhaust the many passages of Scripture. I've simply pointed them out to introduce to you that your Bible teaches that every Christian has two capacities, two natures, two selves, and that they are in constant conflict. Now, when discussing the meaning of the word nature, we have a a very simple, by the way, the first time I was introduced to this Greek word was <clears throat> my first Greek teacher, and uh, you would never guess who he was, but it was Dr. Ralph Kuyper. And, uh, I was a pastor when I was 28 years of age, and up to that point, I had never been to high school. My only training was that in the Bible Institute, and I knew I needed further education. And Dr. Kuyper became my first Greek teacher. And I was reminiscing with him today. I said, do you remember the first time you introduced me to the Greek word phusis? P-H-U-S-I-S? -S? He said, I think I do. I want you to look a little bit at the scripture now to get the meaning of this word nature. Because once you understand the meaning of it, you're going to understand yourself. Because you have two natures. This word phusis simply cont contains the idea of origin, or of beginning, or of birth. That's the idea behind this word, Fusus, translated nature in your Bible. Now your Bible is open to Galatians, and if you will just turn to chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2, I want to read verse 15. Galatians 2, 15. Paul writes, we speaking of Peter and himself and other Jews, we are Jews by nature. Don't be afraid of the term two natures. It's a Bible word. We're Jews by nature. What did he mean? We're Jews by birth, by origin. This is how we had our beginning in the world. We were born Jews. 
We are Jews by nature. Mark that word nature in your Bible. It is so in the King James Version. It is so in the New American Standard Version. It is so in the New King James Version. And that is correctly translated. It is the word nature. We are Jews by birth, by origin, by our beginning. James 1.23 speaks of your natural face. That's the face with which you were born. Natural nature. Both words are linked together, have the same common root. Nature, natural. Your natural face. That's the face with which you were born. That's the face you had when you had your beginning into this world. And uh, you're not responsible for yours, and I'm not responsible for mine. I think we could dress it up a once in a while with a smile, though. Amen. That would help a lot. That would help a lot. So don't be concerned about your face except to keep it smiling. Be it ever so homely, there's no face like your own. <laughs> now let me try to illustrate this word nature for you. It is the nature, now watch how I'm using the word, it is the nature of birds to fly. Birds fly because flying is a distinctively natural characteristic of birds. It is theirs by an innate power. It's the way they were made at the beginning. It's natural for a bird to fly. That's part of their nature. When God created the bird at the beginning, the first bird that was created was created to fly. At a unique beginning. When you read page one in your Bible, you will find the word kind, K-I-N-D, nine times in Genesis chapter one. You should read that chapter and underline that little phrase, after its kind, after its kind, after his kind. What the Bible is teaching is that everything reproduces after its kind. There are diversities of kinds. One kind differs from another kind because each kind has a unique nature. It had a unique beginning. The nature of trees differs from the nature of animals. The nature of man differs from the nature of trees. <clears throat> the nature of man differs from the nature of animals. The nature of man differs from the nature of angels. Why? because each is a special kind. Each had its own unique beginning. That's the way God created everything. That's a wonderful truth. Everything reproduces after its kind, after its own nature, after the way it had its birth, its beginning, its origin. That's a wonderful truth because there's no crossbreeding between the kinds. And that's a hurdle that the evolutionists can never get over. Everything reproduces after its kind. Apes still reproduce apes. You couldn't make a monkey out of me no matter how hard you tried. <laughs> Some of your ancestors might have hung by their necks, but none ever hung by their tails, that's for sure. Everything reproduces after its kind, its nature, its origin, its birth, its beginning. That's the way God created everything. Now to understand this as it relates to us, we're going to look at the two natures of man. We're going to look at the nature of man before the fall. How did God create him in the beginning? What was his nature? in the beginning, when God first created him. Then we're going to look at his nature after the fall and see the change that happened and why we do what we do, why we think the way we think, why we say things the way we say them and for the reason that we say them, why we behave like we do. Let's look first of all at the nature of man as God created him. Turn back please to the book of Genesis. When you have found the book of Genesis, I want you to note in chapter 1, beginning with verse 26. 
Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. And God said, let us make man. Now, God is not speaking to the angels. The angels did not have a part in creation. This, in my judgment, is one of the suggestions to the fact of a tri-personal God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all three were active in the creative work of the Almighty. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, this is the way man is created. This is man's nature at the beginning. This is how he got his start. By the way, did anybody ever tell you how Father's Day got started? Did anyone at Father's Day got started? He got up at 7 o'clock. He shaved and took his usual morning walk and came back and had his breakfast. That's how Father's Day got started. Now the rest of you think that over on your way back to your room. And uh, some of you who are awake, you tell the others what it means. And uh, maybe someday on Father's Day you can have a little fun. We received, I received a Father's Day card from one of my sons and his wife, I know that she picked out the card. And the card had a little verse on that went like this. To a great dad who's got what it takes from those who takes what he's got. <laughs> and I tell you, it was true. <laughs> it was true. That, that sweet daughter-in-law, she really nailed it down. And uh, we've had a lot of fun with that. Now, let's look at man before the fall. We're going to see man's nature, his origin, his beginning, his birth. Let's use that word just once more, his phusis, how he got his start. Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Now, what does that mean? First, let me suggest that it means that man shared, now listen carefully, he shared in God's nature. Not perfectly, nor permanently, but in the beginning he shared in God's nature. Not fully, nor forever, but to a point of degree he shared in God's nature. In other words, God gave to him certain communicable attributes. God gave him life. God gave him personality. There are three essentials to personality. Number one, there is intellect, the ability to think, to reason. That's a gift from God. God gave that to Adam. In that, he was like God. Not only intellect, but emotion. The capability of weeping, of laughing, of loving, of hating of being sorrowful, of being joyful. The emotion, that's a gift from God. God gave that to Adam. He was sharing in God's nature. God laughs, Psalm 2, 4, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. God weeps, Jesus wept. He was a man of sorrows. He was a man of emotion. God gave that gift to Adam. Adam shared that with God, emotion, intellect, and thirdly, will or volition, the ability to make choices, the ability to think things through and then make a decision to make a choice. That's a gift from God. God gave that to Adam. Holiness. God gave Adam holy. Adam was holy when God created him. This is man before the fall. Now God's purpose in creating man in his image was functional. It was that man would have fellowship with God and rule for God. Take control of God's earth and run it for God. God was the owner. Man was his caretaker, his custodian. Man didn't own anything. God put him here to take care of that which belongs to God. This is Adam in the beginning. However, there was one attribute that God did not give to Adam. It was not a part of Adam's nature, of his phusis, of his origination. 
when he first got started, this was one thing that God did not give to Adam. God did not commute or give to Adam or pass on to Adam the ability to remain unchangeable. We call that immutability. God is immutable. God doesn't change. What God is today, He always was and always will be. Malachi says, I change not. God giving the message to the prophet. I do not change. I am eternally the same. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. God is immutable. He cannot change. He did not give that to Adam. Adam could change, and he did. The first time the devil entered into the garden, Adam made a bad choice, and we call that the fall. Now, Adam didn't lose everything in the fall. Lost his holiness. Lost his fellowship with God. Things changed for Adam, not for the good. He made a bad choice. And we call that the fall. Now, there is Adam before the fall. In the likeness and the image of God. Sharing the nature of God. By a bad choice, he broke away from God. Now we're going to look briefly at man after the fall, his nature. What happened to this nature that was like God in the beginning? What happened? Well, Adam's fall resulted in a drastic change. I'm calling that the change in his nature. He was no longer the same kind. Now remember that word kind. We'll be using it frequently, nine times in Genesis chapter 1. Everything reproduces after its own kind, after its own nature. You cannot crossbreed one with another. Now, there are some things you can crossbreed, but they're of the same kind. You can't crossbreed an apricot with a grapefruit. You can't have a tree growing apricots and grapefruit. Now, you can have a tree growing grapefruit oranges and lemons. I have a friend in Florida who has all three growing in one tree, but they're all one kind. They're of the citrus kind, you see. That you can put them together, but you can never crossbreed that which is not of the same kind, of the same nature. So we find now here's a man who has a change in his nature. He's no longer the same kind of person he was when God created him. Before the change, of nature. His life was one of pleasure and of peace, of fellowship with God, of obedience to the will of God. But after the fall, after the change, after the change of nature, he's no longer the same kind. He's now of a different kind. There is no longer that pleasure and peace. There's pain, there's problems, there's heartache. He alienated himself from the life of God. Now he's going to pay for it. Now he has two natures. His fellowship with God has been broken all because of a change in his nature. Now follow me. I'm trying to lay this out slowly so that you will be able to lead on in our next study. Now Adam has to face the future. There are only two of them there in the garden, Adam and Eve. That's the ideal marriage. God established one man for one woman, vice versa, and no more until death separates that marriage. Last week, Mrs. Strauss and I celebrated our 58th wedding anniversary. And it uh, hasn't been a perfect marriage. You don't have a perfect marriage. Well, for several reasons. Number one, there is no perfect woman, so you can't have perfect marriage. <laughs> and number two, there is no perfect man. So you put two imperfect people together and you can't have a perfect marriage. We've had some ups and some downs and uh, we've been able to survive. And we're still working at it. Still isn't perfect. After 58 years, 
It's not perfect, and we don't expect it to be until we are conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Adam has to face the future. And in facing the future, he has to consider something. That is, and he already knows this, that everything must reproduce after its kind. You cannot plant a plum tree and get apples from it. You can't plant red beet seeds and pull up carrots. Everything reproduces after its kind. Adam has to face that. He's facing the future now. He's going to have children. Now, he could have had children before the fall. When God created Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, he said, be fruitful and multiply. But they had no children before the fall. If they would have had babies before the fall, the babies would have been holy. They would have been perfect, sharing the nature of God. They would have had only one nature because everything reproduces after its kind. But there were no children before the fall. Now he's facing the future, but he cannot face it independent of the future and the children that will be attached to them in the future. What's going to happen? Well, they're going to have children. Posterity is a privilege. And you younger people who are looking forward to your posterity or presently having children, may I say that posterity is a privilege, but it's also one of great responsibility. For you are going to reproduce after your kind. A great responsibility. Now, Adam has to face that. Whether he's aware of all this or not, I do not know. But being the, having the intelligence that God gave to him, the intellect, he certainly must have been thinking because God had already said, be fruitful and multiply. He's got to be thinking about these babies that are coming along. Now, suppose he had retained his original nature, the children would have been exactly like mother and daddy but they fell. Now, turn a couple of pages in Genesis to chapter 4. In chapter 4, you have the first murder. What in the world happened? God created a perfect man. He put him in a perfect environment. And his kid becomes a murderer. His first son becomes... What's wrong? His children inherited his nature after the fall. So you have the first murder in chapter 4. In chapter 4 and verse 19, Lamech, the great grandson of Cain, who killed Abel, the great grandson of the first murder, he becomes a polygamist. Have you ever heard Preachers preach about and write about the new morality. There's no new morality. The new morality began in Genesis chapter 4. That's the first polygamist right there. Nothing new about it. It's part of the old nature. And the great grandson of Cain becomes a polygamist and also a murderer. Now, as the human race grew in number and expanded... So did sin. Why does the world become increasingly worse and not better? Because everything reproduces after its kind. As the race gets larger and expands, there's more sin, more wickedness. This is the way it has to be. Everything reproduces after its kind. And in chapter 6, God sends the great judgment. And uh, he wipes out the human race. And saves one man, his wife, and their three sons and their wives. Eight people were saved. Now, wouldn't you think that after that severe judgment that wipes out the whole human race, that that man and his wife and those three sons and their wives coming out of the ark... Don't you think they would have said, hey, from now on, we're going to toe the mark. We have seen something that the world has never seen before. We're going to toe the mark. 
they're not out of the ark very long until, at, until Noah gets drunk. You say, couldn't he learn his lesson? No, he's got two natures now. I'm sure he wanted to. I'm sure he desired to. Seeing what God had done to the rest of the race, I'm sure that man and his wife had in their hearts to say, we're going to have a family altar and our boys and their wives are going to follow God. But they didn't because they couldn't. They don't have only one nature. They now have two natures. They inherited that. God gave them a fresh start, but to no avail. Now, we're laying the ground for a very important and serious study. You don't have to live a defeated life, nor do I. The conflict will go on, but there's possibility for victory along the way. We don't have to live in constant defeat. We don't have to throw in the towel and say there's no hope in this Christian life. There is. But you and I have come into the world with the same nature that Adam had after the fall for the simple reason that everything reproduces after its kind. Psalm 51, 5, David said, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, rightly understood, that verse does not suggest that the sexual relation between David's parents was sinful. That's not what he meant. When he said, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me, he is simply saying that mother had a sin nature, daddy had a sin nature, and that's all they could give to me. And that's all your dear darling mother and your dear daddy could give to you and that's all that my parents could give to me. That's all they had to give to me, their fallen nature. Now you know why there is a struggle. I will not leave you without some answers from the Bible. We'll pursue our study tomorrow, the Lord willing. Let us pray. Our loving Father, we thank Thee for the Holy Scriptures, for divine truth, in all of its simplicity and yet with all of its profundity. We thank Thee that it has pleased Thee to give to us the Holy Scriptures, and we thank Thee for the invention of the printing press, which has made possible the placing into our hands this wonderful book, the Bible, Thy Holy Word. Bless it to our hearts tonight and be with all of my brethren who share in the ministry this week. May each one come to this platform in the fullness of the Spirit's blessing and power. We are thy servants, Lord, and we simply want thee to use thy word for thy glory and for the good of all who gather. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.